So in order to make this a really worthwhile time together, it's a short time that we have, this one hour. Uh, but, you know, we can also think this way for our entire day, our entire week, our entire month, our entire life, is if you think about how generally we stumble through life without much motivation, or maybe have a motivation uh, to, you know, anyway, there's not much motivation. Even we get up and go to work and get up for the day, whatever it is, you know, there's not a lot of motivation involved. There's this sort of um, uh, default motivation. You know, we just do it. We just kind of get up and get going. And there is intention behind that. There is motivation and intention. And if we really check what was, what is driving your intention today? You know, if you think about on a normal day, uh, just to, and it's a good meditation to get involved in, but just on a on a on a um, just to give you the uh, the sort of uh, general answer is when we get up in the morning and go about our day, we're generally just our intention is to feel good and to avoid not feeling good. If you really check, you know, and we have different interpretations and different uh, methods. You know, everyone has something else that feel like some persons may what feel good is go work in the garden. Someone else, what might feel good is to finish a project. Someone else might, might feel good is to watch TV, go visit people, but it's all, you know, what we're looking at in Buddhist psychology is not the content as much as the process in terms of the process and what the beginning of the process is intention. Okay. So more and more, we become more mindful, more aware of what's driving us. Okay. And this is the biggest thing. I and mean, this is really what Lam Yeshi is talking about an ego attachment and liberation. And really it's, it's the fundamental purpose <clears throat> foundation <clears throat> of uh, Buddhist uh, inspiration, you know, the inspiration to, to try and figure this out. So just for this hour, we just think, okay, well, the intention to be here, you know, probably, I mean, it's good to say my intention is to become enlightened in this hour. We don't want to discourage people from that. But uh, at the same time, the, the very least, the intention is to that this hour provides the, will generate the results that are more profound than just getting up and having a piece of toast, which is, it can be just like that. It can be just like having a piece of toast this hour. So the way to do that is think, okay, whatever happens this hour, at the very minimum, I'm dedicating to discovering my inner potential, uh, which is limitless. And once I tap into that, then the whole world and my whole life forever will be changed. And the way, the reason to do that uh, from the Mahayana Buddhist point of view is really so that I myself can out of this circle of confusion and for the purpose of myself and for helping all the other living beings because I can't just walk away and leave them behind like in a burning house or something. Okay. So that's the way to think to get your mind habituated with that way of thinking. Eventually that way of thinking, by the way, that sense of others, you know, it, it, for us, it's <clears throat> somewhat contrived, right? We have to think about it. Uh, but that's not actually the true sense of having a compassionate or loving attitude when it when we're talking about beings who've actualized it there is no conceptual well it goes through stages of course but but the real uh, generation of love and compassion and warmth and affection are not conceptual and they're not contrived our level, you know, of course, we have a lot of contrived, you know, we have to start with being contrived, practicing, rehearsing, but it's a little bit like, like, uh, if I can just common example is, uh, we don't have to, in general, you know, it's amazing, we don't have to tell mothers to love their kids, or fathers, especially mothers. Isn't it interesting? You know, you don't like when, in general, when a woman has a baby, there's not some sort of program that they need to go through to teach them to love their child. It's just so amazing. It just happens, you know, it's, just, it's an organic, it's instinctual. So, so, you know, I'm just talking, of course, there's many factors to that. And, and that's not my point. Point is it's non-conceptual, right? You follow me? Yeah. So that's the kind of love and compassion that we can 
actually, I, I mean, really, truly, we can develop that within our mind streams. That's the goal. I sincerely, I think everyone knows that that can be done. Uh, the question is, number one, do we think about it? Do we think about developing those qualities? So for the most part, the spiritual, so what the, the, the defines the spiritual person, I think, is a person who says, yeah, I have the potential for unlimited love and affection and compassion and wisdom for others, uh, but, I need, but then I need to develop it. That's the part where we kind of stumble. Well, two points. I don't know if we took a survey, you know, amongst all the 7 billion people on the planet who believes that they, that they uh, possess that quality, that potential. It'd be interesting to, to think about that. And then it's not, a, so then that might be a real minority. And then even people say, yes, yes, I, I do believe we have unlimited potential. Then the second part is, oh, well, are you, are you investigating that? And are you committed to developing it? Um, I think that's, I don't know. What do people think? You think that's a majority of the people, a minority? What, what do you think? I think that, you know, there's many levels of trying to, you know, practice that or develop, uh, you know, people who uh, adhere to religious practice, you know, uh, probably are thinking, you know, whether they're, whatever religion they are, that, that there's something more to their purpose and they're trying to develop it in, within, the, within the structure of their religious beliefs. So I think it's kind of there for people. The idea that there's more than this mundane existence. Uh, and so what, they, what we have is we turn to spiritual traditions and religious traditions for the answers to that. Um, Buddhist answer is that it all has to do with psychology. It all has to do with the mind itself. Okay? So it's not even, uh, this is kind of a tricky point. It's not even about Buddha. So Buddha, you know, I think in our Judeo-Christian upbringing, many of us will start relate. You know, when we first start getting involved in Buddhism, we relate to Buddha as 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 a, as a god as God. We we learn that oh, his Buddha's qualities are different than the qualities that are described as God's qualities, right? You know, philosophically, it's not Buddha is not defined in the same way that God is defined. But even um, the real, that's still not really the, the idea. The real idea, if Buddha is there as a guide, but Buddha is not there as, as some kind of God that's going to bestow enlightenment on us, okay? So that's a hard one. I think that doesn't work for a lot of people because that's, that's counter to our religion, Judeo, Judeo you know, whatever our upbringing is was Judeo-Christian or scientific, whatever, you know, we, we, we seem to be sort of um, recruited into this idea that, that God, whatever you call it, will bestow enlightenment upon us at the right time, and as soon as we're good enough, right? Now, it doesn't mean that Buddha or these enlightened beings, omniscient mind, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't mean that they can't assist. They definitely can assist in big ways. You know, big, big, big ways. They just can't bestow that, you know. You, we can, if we open our minds up and create the conditions, then of course, enlightened beings can bless our minds and give us inspiration and give us, uh, help our minds to have insights. That, that's true. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's dependent upon us, you see. Well, it's dependent on them too, but it's dependent on us. Uh, there are blessings to be received. I mean, you, you, one can receive blessings every second because the omniscient mind is, is present every second. And the omniscient mind of all of these beings, their only wish is for us to be, attain ultimate happiness. So what's in the way is we're in the way, okay? Now, Barbara's question last week in terms of the homework um, I think, and, and Anna, you can remind me, but let me see if I can, I think Anna was, I think Barbara was saying, are the distractions perm impermanent as well? Was that the question?
Anna? I, I understood the question to be, um, are distractions movement? Okay. And, and I think absolutely that they are. Right. So movement means impermanent. It's, it's a kind of a, 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 a synonym, right? Correct. Yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah. So because they arise and they fall away, don't they? Now, uh, the, what, what, one of our topics in this class, and I think we touched on it last week, is the, that is the nature, the conventional nature of the distractions of the mind, of thoughts, of images, right? But our experience of them is that they're not moving, correct? This is really important to discover in our meditation that intellectually we hear the teachings and go, oh, okay, they're movement, they're impermanent. That's, that's only part of the process. The other part of the process is to become identify, to identify, to become familiar with how all these different ways that ignorance, we could say the mind, but really it's ignorance, which is part of the mind, constructs this reality for us that is um, false. So it's very important to discover through analysis and meditation using analytical meditation as well as focus meditation uh, to watch the mind and see how the mind projects. So one thing is, is the conventional truth is that the thoughts are impermanent, they're moving moment, arising, abiding and falling away, right? So that's the intellectual, that's the philosophical uh, conventional truth, right? But what is it that we see? What is it that we experience? So in a sense, it's like a really important sort of regress into the problem, if you know what I mean. So it's really important to understand the mechanisms that why do we, if things, let's just say impermanence, if things are moving, what is it? First of all, if things are moving, do we see that? And the answer is generally no. So point two is, what do you see? It's super important, even though it's wrong, it is how we see things. So it's important, like, like if you keep stepping on the gas pedal when you're supposed to step on the brake, okay, it's one thing to say, well, no, the gas pedal, step on the gas or step on the brake, right? But it's more important at our level to understand how is it that I keep stepping on the gas pedal? It's not enough just to step on the brake, to say, oh, I need to step on the brake. We have to understand the psychological mechanisms that are driving us to keep seeing things as permanent when they're not, okay? That is, that's what analytical meditation is about. Focus meditation, so we, um, just to review for a minute, well, not review from this class, but, in terms of uh, Buddhist meditation, uh, typically meditation, right? We, we're thinking about uh, concentration. So if you ask people, what is, what is meditation? And the people say, oh, I meditate. And you ask, well, what, what do you do when you meditate? What is it? Oh, I watch my breath, right? Or I focus on a mantra, or I focus on a syllable, or I focus on a candle, or I focus, right? So what they're talking about is, is uh, placement meditation is a technical term, right? So single pointed concentration. Uh, what you don't find in other traditions, it seems, is the second kind of meditation that we, all, we are engaged with and in, in um, uh, concern with developing. And that is referred to as analytical meditation, okay? And we have to learn both. And that's the beauty of this, of this school of thought, you know, in terms of Tibetan Buddhist or Buddhist thought is, wow, you know, what is this analytical meditation? It hasn't really reached the mainstream, by the way, has it? You know, when we hear about all the mindfulness practice and all, you know, that's reached the mainstream. That's all placement meditation for the most part, isn't it? You know, focus on your breath, focus on uh, the feelings, the sensations, things like that. But there's not really an analysis that goes on, is there? There's not a discriminated thinking that goes on, is there? Like, 
So what I'm talking about is going into becoming an invest is this is an investigative meditation. Analytical meditation is investigative. Okay, so you investigate, you investigate how when you're meditating, you investigate. Like let's just close our eyes for a moment. And let's just watch the breath for you know to get the mind settled for a couple of minutes, and then I'll interject. And just keep bringing the mind back to the breath. Now think of what you need to do today. Now look at that, whether it's a thought or an image, and see how it appears as a permanent phenomenon. Intellectually, you know it's not permanent, and it might have already faded. But when you think about what you're going to do today, or eat today, how does it appear to you? It appears permanent, unchanging. Sure, it disappears, but when, it, when you're experiencing it, it probably appears as a fixed phenomenon, even if it's fixed for just a moment or two. Then another one comes up. And then another one. But they, they come up not as a stream we don't experience them as a stream, even though that's their nature, but we experience them as slides, fixed images or thoughts. Can you see that? So I just want you to spend a moment or two getting familiar with that. So going back to our homework, the distractions arise as permanent phenomena. Now let's see if you can see how they're not permanent. Just see if, if see more of the flow of the mind in which these images are just now in a fluid sense and not a concrete sense. It's kind of like you just sort of, you just feel very smoothly kind of gliding along in your mind, okay? Not fix, don't fix on anything. And now look at as you as you're observing the fluidity of your mind are you are you aware of its fluidity like every half second you know half second to half second to half second or second to second or whatever just check the time time frame But in fact, it's even smaller than that, right? See if you can go from quarter second to quarter second. Okay, 
eighth of a second to eighth of a second. What arises right now is gone right now. Okay, let's just bring your mind back to here, whatever that is. Okay. Okay. So the purpose of that, if you can do that more on your own, uh, the purpose, of course, is do you notice that like a little taste of maybe closer to what reality is, juxtaposed to what we all we typically do? Okay, that's the idea. I mean, just to give a little taste that the way we experience our world is not actually the way it exists, is it? That's pretty profound. And that's the foundation of all of our work, all of our process. That's the foundation. We have to become familiar with that, okay? Uh, sorry, I know there's a chat thing. Okay. So, um, okay. So is everyone with me? Did I have I left someone behind? Don't be shy or you can be shy, but you can unmute anything I need uh, you want to say. Barbara. I um, understand so much of it mentally. Right. I, and I guess that's where the focus on insight medication, meditation comes in, is to make it real, not just in my head. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, what we're doing, Barbara, is we're not trained for insight. Okay. We're trained for, we know as Buddha, Buddha or Buddha's Buddha means awakened. So what we must be is asleep or whatever the opposite awakened is. So that's what you, so insight is, is kind of insight. I would say is like a, an awakened moment, you know, it can be not so deep. It can be, but it's, it's profoundly different than our normal way of being. So what I was, what I'm emphasizing here is be, become aware of what asleep means. Okay. So when we have, when we talk about insight, it's almost like we're talking about insight into reality. But um, I really want to stress that it, at this point, it's very important to have insight into our non-reality. Because we don't even, you know, most people don't even know anything about this, right? And then once, like you said, once you know intellectually, it's not enough. So you have to, you, we have to investigate, investigate. So, you know, we're always pretty much focused on investigating, you know, the, the truth, whether impermanence or suffering, all of, but, but I am stressing to investigate the untruth. And in fact, in the Four Noble Truths, right, which is Buddha's first teaching, he taught the truth of suffering first, not the truth of nirvana, <laughs> right? The reason he taught the truth of suffering first, my belief, I don't know if it's true, is because we don't accept that there's suffering. Now, whether it's suffering or this confused reality that we're perceiving, I, I think they're synonyms, okay? So this confused reality of seeing things as permanent when they're not, I think that is a synonym for suffering. Okay. So we don't see even that we've seen things wrongly. So my stress here is become very familiar with the wrongly. Of course, we want to have, uh, I mean, this goes without saying we want familiarity with, with the right. Right. I mean, that, that just goes without saying. But the power of seeing things truly comes from uh, being very, very familiar with how we see things wrongly. I just really want to stress that. To have the courage to investigate that 
you know, we see there's a lot of, you know, so there's a lot of layers um, to our view of unreality. There's a lot of, so if we want to, so our goal in Buddhist psychology, philosophy, in this path is to see reality. It's, it's very basic, I would say. It's very, very, very basic. The only thing we're really trying to do is have a perception of reality. Of course, why is because then you develop that, you know, there's qualities to develop from that, uh, one of them being happiness. So in, in the development, so when, it, when having, uh, so if we meditate on reality, which is everything from the most profound level of uh, emptiness of inherent existence to grosser levels of in, 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 um, uh, insight into permanence and, and these kinds of things, suffering, all those. So uh, those are just layers. And so in the same way, we, if we turn it around, we should look at the layers of our, of our confused point of view or ignorant point of view, whatever you want to call it. So the ignorant, you know, like a bodhisattva who's, who's meditating on emptiness and has d direct insight into, into, into emptiness still has a layer of ignorance that the seventh level bodhisattva doesn't, or the third level bodhisattva, and the second, you know, second level bodhisattva. So, you know, there's, it's, it's a constant peeling away of the layer of ignorance. And the layer of ignorance peels away through deeper insight into reality. They're, they're, they are juxtaposed to each other. So we can just focus on meditating on reality and deepening our insight into reality. That's, we can do that. I think it's quicker to also meditate on non-reality. How in our psychological mechanisms, our psychological makeup that gets us into this situation. We have to understand that. Okay. And I think Lama is, is, is saying the same thing in the book, Ego Attachment and Liberation. Um, are we with each other? Yeah. Yeah. I have, a, I have a question. Sure. I get goofed up. Well, then what is reality? <laughs> you get goofed up. <laughs> well, well, no, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's, 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 the quintessential pro, uh, question, right? Uh, but what is reality is is um, what we spend years and years and years studying and meditating on. Okay, um, there's many layers to define that, and I don't want to lose people because it's a, it's it's a it's the most profound subject in the universe, probably. The nature of reality but so the to understand what is reality we also have to understand this is my whole point sorry if i'm on a soapbox here we have to understand what's not reality okay so um i so we do long classes in what reality is right i mean we you know even in the uh, in the discovering buddhism we have a whole module discussing you know the uh nature of reality emptiness shunyata whatever you want to call it so the nature of reality, I just, just, so you see us, what is reality? So I'm not going to frustrate you by saying what reality isn't, because I'd like to answer that way. <laughs> so the, so what reality is, well, here's one way of saying it. This will, this might frustrate you, but um, reality, start with this. Reality is perceiving something that exists the way we see it. Perceiving ourselves in, 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 in uh, specifically seeing your identity, yourself, your personality in the way it actually exists. That's, that's the definition of reality for us, working definition. And then seeing phenomena, so that means everything, all the objective world, seeing all the objects or the objective world, seeing those objects in the way they truly, in the way they really exist. Okay. Bullet point three, or bullet point, yeah, third bullet point is 
we don't see either of those the way they exist. We don't see our identity, which they call the self or the I, the self, as it really is. When we see the self as it truly exists, we see reality. So then we go into the study as, well, what the heck do I see? Let's just go back to my discussion for the last 25 minutes, right? So we have to become familiar with what it is we see. And I think your question is really important because yes, you do need a barometer. You need to go, you know, you, uh, not just a barometer, you need a, a vantage point. So when we, uh, so remember, we're, we're, our, our concern is our identity, self. Why? I don't see myself and yourself, the self, in the way it exists. So I see unreality. Is that clear? When, and this is, this is a huge, and it's so significant in, in what, what d- defines Buddhist approach, is when I see the, my, the self in the way it does exist, it's an unending process of liberation. It is the beginning of liberation, freedom, control, happiness. Okay. There are, when I see the self for what it really is, then you then one's being develops compassion, affection, equanimity, love, wisdom, skillful means. Those things are byproducts. That are gonna, and they don't just have you know you develop them right. You're involved in a developmental process. But it's hard to develop them in when we haven't realized reality of the self. Okay, what is the reality of the self? We won't because this is not the nature of this class. But it will oh, on the terms of liberation section that we'll talk about. Uh, so right now, how we see ourselves is all these descriptions, and um, there's book. You know, of course, there's huge volumes of books that we study just on this topic. Okay, so I'm not going to go that deep (laughs) but i just want to say when you think of barbara when you think of lewis when you think of shivani shivani shivari shivani when you think of anna when you think of Catherine, and i say to you if i say to you say um if i say hey barbara and you go oh me like that right or Catherine or anna you know i call your name you're gonna go oh like that right me he's talking to me correct in the same way we go i want to eat i want to sleep i'm going to watch this class today i'm going to walk over here i'm going to walk over there i'm going to go to sleep i'm going to turn on the lamp i'm going to turn the lamp off i'm going to sit down i'm going to stand up each instant there's non-stop even when we're sleeping i i i i i that's the self we're talking about that self which we relate to every instant. If I say to you, you know, what color is your hair? You're going to say my hair is, you know, black or whatever. That's the same I, self. That sense of self is wrong. It's a misperception. For example, just like we're watching the mind and the thoughts and we see them, that sense of self we see as permanent. Same thing. Eventually you become... It comes down to the same basic arguments. We see that self as permanent, unchanging. That is how you, we see ourselves. When we talk about, you know, I got a degree from uh, Olympia, Washington, University of Washington. Or I work as a physical therapist. Whatever you do, and I do, every instant, there's a sense of I. And that sense of I is seen as unchanging, permanent. Just so, and, and other wrong conceptions, but we'll just stick on this one for now. It's not permanent. It changes instant to instant, actually. If it wasn't changing, then you would, you, you would still be, you know, walking and talking like a baby, right? 
you would have the same level of intelligence and awareness you had when you were a baby, but obviously you've changed, right? But the, con the concept of oneself is that you're fixed, unchanging. That's just one misconception, by the way. It gets deeper. It, and then the deepest one, it, it, the deepest layer that one realizes in reality, and I'll just throw this at you so that we can talk about it later. So, you know, there's four philosophical schools in Buddhism. And the whole construction of those four schools are based primarily on this one question. What is reality? And then they'll say, and then they, they branch it into reality of the self and the reality of phenomena or objects. Okay. So now you're, you're all schooled in this. This is really helpful because then you're going to go, Oh, okay. So now if you're outside of these four schools of Buddhist philosophy, philosophy, and you ask, if you ask scientists, if you ask psychologists, right? What's the self that you're talking about? They'll have some answer, won't they? It's not very articulated, by the way. It's a very confused science, a new science. If you ask, uh, you know, not to pick on any religion, but you ask the Christians, what's the true self? What's the, what, what's the nature of myself? And they might say, what's well, the soul, right? I'm being very simplistic, so I don't want to offend anybody. But, you know, let's say the soul. And then you ask them, well, what's the soul? And most people don't know because they don't study like that. But when you, when you dig down, you'll find that the soul that they're talking about is something permanent. Okay? And it just logically can't, it, well, logically and not just logically, but in, instinctually, it, that, can't, that doesn't hold. So in the Buddhist schools, the four schools, they define this soul, this self or soul in different ways. And the highest school is the one that we eventually want to pay attention to. But all four schools are taught for, for reasons to build to help people progress along their understanding of reality. Okay. So just to go back uh, and reiterate. The job, number one job in Buddhist approach is to understand reality. It all comes down to that. Sure, we have lots of teachings on developing compassion. We have lots of teachings to, uh, talking about developing meditation and insight. We have lots of teachings on how to develop love. Lots of teachings on how to develop uh, all, all those you know, qualities. But those are always in relationship to the nature of reality. Okay. Did I lose everybody? <laughs> Everyone looks. <laughs> I didn't even put a slide up, you guys. Very tricky. I think you're 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 you didn't want me to go with my slideshow, right? <laughs> so uh, I want to say something. Also, uh, reiterate that the process of understanding reality alone is liberating. You don't have to wait till you fully understand reality. Only person that understands reality fully and has integrated it, where not understanding, excuse me, uh, one understanding reality has that person then is not a Buddha because of that, that I mean. The Buddha is someone who understands reality and now 24 hours every instant is perceiving reality. That's what a Buddha is. And for Shakyamuni in his life story, lives story, took three countless eons. Well, two countless eons from the time when he added direct insight perception of reality to when he became a Buddha. Two countless great eons. Milarepa, on the other hand, it was a matter of years between when he had direct insight in, into reality and he attained enlightenment all in one lifetime. Okay, so, you know, it, 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 can, it varies. It's a path. Whether it takes two countless eons or 20 years, we don't know. You know, that, that's, that's individual. Okay. Um, so there we got reality, right? Are we okay? Are we okay? No one's having a... 
meltdown or anything? This is close to where we finished last time, I think, if you remember. Uh, so this is Lama's, uh, your mental bureaucracy. So this is what we're talking about earlier, about I that we need to understand unreality. We need to be skeptical. What he means, we, we, mean, we need to be investigative. You need to be your own psychologist, checking, 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 using your brain and your mind to check. So I, I, I want to emphasize, that's what I was trying to emphasize before. We want to check unreality as much as reality. We have to become familiar with unreality, okay? Malamu goes on to say, this is all a part of inner freedom, liberation, and enlightenment. So when we talk about uh, the qualities of our mind, so when we're talking about meditation, training the mind. So Meditation. So let's let's be um, let's agree upon the word meditation. The when I'm talking about it, really we're talking about mind training. Why? Because the mind is tends to wander. It, it can't stay focused. So you might have an insight, you know, like you've had in in like we talked about last couple of weeks, where we have an insight into some deeper reality. You might have that through. Um, nature or in a retreat or in relationship to, you know, with another person that's, uh, that's non-conceptual. Okay. It's a non-conceptual aha experience. There's different ways we can have that. Right. Uh, but we don't stay there. You know what I mean? It's like, we don't cultivate, we have a hard time cultivating it and it may change our life forever, but at the same time, it loses its, it's lo it loses its depth and it doesn't, continue to evolve and develop. Now, that's because the mind itself is untrained. If we could focus on that experience, right, then that focusing itself would allow it to nurture and build and develop. Okay, there's different things we need to do, but primarily we need to be able to focus. So this wandering mind is a, bit, is, is, is a big part of the problem. So um, Lama says, you don't have to strain to control your mind. You know, so he used to say, don't squeeze. Just be wise. Try to understand and identify how your ego functions. There you go again. That's, that's the theme for today, right? Or part of the theme. With understanding, control comes automatically. And your mind becomes healthy and happy. Control of the mind is a natural thing, not artificial. So here's the the, 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 the the message, the takeaway is that understanding how the mind functions itself is the path to control. It's the, it is the technique of control to get to controlling. And, you know, generally speaking, you know, control is one of those negative words, right? But actually uh, it's not negative if, it, if you're in control. Right now, we're not in control of the mind. It does whatever it wants to do, doesn't it? So uh, this path, this path. Now, the reason it does whatever it does, you know, just just to reiterate, again, to repeat, if one begins to in, have insight into reality, the mind loses the power to take control, and. We could say, well, let the parts of the mind that we refer to as the afflictions or ignorance, okay? Through understanding, control comes automatically. It's just, it's like shining a light in a dark basement. All the rats just disappear, the cockroaches, don't they? It's a lot, it's a little bit like that. This power of control subdues all the problems. This power of control, I mean, and this control is just, it's, it's really very linked with just a matter of awareness. It has a lot, it's just a matter of awareness. It's like if you, you know, if one of us, if we have a compulsion, that we always just kind of go to the refrigerator at about 10 and 30 at night and reach for the ice cream. And we know we shouldn't do it and we want to stop or go to, or, or whatever the compulsion is, you know, like that. Um, and we know we shouldn't do it, right? And we beat ourselves up for it or whatever. And then, but that doesn't help control the mind, does it? It's interesting. 
it's kind of what, why it does is because it actually gives those afflictions more power because you're in you're in relationship and intimidated by those that that desire for the ice cream and then you beat yourself up so the way the the, way the control comes from is just through understanding how that mind arises at around 10 26 that, that says you you need to have some ice cream and then you begin to watch it and so if you fight it it gives it power fight it i mean you know aggressively if you use your wisdom and insight and understanding awareness it doesn't know what to do with that because it only knows what to do with an with with an adversary it doesn't know what to do with with a with a, a compassionate gaze so compassion in this sense is just like really watching it learning from it non-judgmental just like curiosity it takes away its power over time so the other one is uh when we're meditating we're developing mind training we have the wandering mind but then we also got the dull mind right and this is where you get sluggish or sleepy and what you can do is um there's different techniques to activate the the mind uh you know like focusing on 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 a, on a sort of light uh, a sense of light uh just below the navel inside you and you just visualize it getting clearer brighter and more radiant and so because the foggy mind is like a dark mind so you allow this brightness in the below the navel to kind of slowly radiate through your whole being. And then you bring, you can also, what you do is you bring your breath down um, and you bring what, it's a breathing technique, which I'm not going to teach right now because we're running out of time. But when you inhale, you hold it for a second and the breath goes down to the navel and then from your uh, lower chakra, from your anus, you bring the air up for a moment. And so it's kind of squeezed there, not, not like in a tight way, but just gently tight. And that sort of adds, adds fuel to this light and it'll expand and then you exhale and the light continues to get brighter and brighter and that helps to release the foggy mind. Okay, and the Lama says from there, electric light energy radiates throughout your nervous system, heart, brain, legs, knees, feet, like that. And then you just dwell on that and you breathe through your nose. Okay, I know that's very quick, but it's, it's at least introduction to us. So what we're talking about today is the ego itself. So all this thing, I see things permanently. I see things. So the ego or the ignorance, um, what it does is, is it immediately projects onto our experience. And it projects a lot of wrong things. And what we've talked about mostly is it projects permanence. Because I think that's an easy one to understand. But there's other things it projects. Okay, it projects beauty, for example, when there's no beauty there. It projects ugliness when it's not ugly either. All these wrong conceptions the ego projects. Now, when I when Lama uses the word ego, I think it's a synonym for ignorance. Okay, but we can use ego, ignorance doesn't matter. And then immediately, because the ego projects permanence, beauty, uh, ugliness, harm, unhappiness, all those things, then attachment follows without hesitation. Okay, very, very important. They, you can't help it. This is the natural mechanism of the mind that's been existing since beginningless time. This is what we've been doing. And when we talk about enlightenment or liberation or freedom, we have to understand we've been doing this other one for, for since eons and eons and eons of time. So we're so blessed uh, uh, to be going to even hear these ideas like, wow. And, and the problem with hearing these ideas, by the way, is there is a curse. There is a curse. Okay, you want to know what the curse is? Anyone know what the curse is? Is, is the curse seeing emptiness or reality, but lacking compassion? That's related to the curse. The curse is that you can never unknow this now that you've heard it. <laughs> You're going to say, ah, shit, I wish he never said that. <laughs> you can't unhear it. Sorry. And then the ad added part to the curse is that now you know it, but you can't actualize it. It's like, I know this is wrong, but why can't I see it right? 
but just we just have to hang in there. It gets better and better. It kind of gets seems like it gets worse at first, by the way. Don't worry. I don't know where people are at in their practice and this, but but also people listen to this recording. You have to understand that people will say often, oh, man, I, I was doing fine until I heard that idea that Karuna was talking about. And I tried meditating and my mind got much worse. Ever since I started meditating, my mind is more distracted than ever. Right. Any people have that experience? Yeah, it's not true. It's just you for once became aware of all the distractions and the and the stuff in our minds, you know, the, the junk. We just didn't know it was there. It's like it's like when you haven't looked under your kitchen sink for 15 years. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it was like because you looked is the problem. No, it's because you didn't look earlier and start cleaning it out. Okay, right? So you can blame me if you want, but it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Okay. So just a little technique, technical stuff, okay? I think it's very helpful to have this. So when, uh, so listen, the ego, ego or the mind, ignorance, whatever. So our mind is constantly functioning, by the way, even in a coma, it's still functioning. Deep sleep, it's functioning. And so this mind experiences the world, experiences everything through the six senses, okay? Uh, the eye, eye, ear, eye sense, ear sense, nose sense, tongue sense, body sense, and then what we, what we call the mental sense, which is the kind of like the brain, the mind. And these six senses don't exist on their own. They have to have an object. So the eye has a, has a visual object, right? The ear has a, has a sound. The nose has a smell, right? Those are things outside or objective. The tongue has a taste. Otherwise, tongue just doesn't exist without a taste, does it? Well, it doesn't. The body has, you know, tactile senses. And then the mental sense has thoughts and images and dreams and memories. So if you have a, if you have a, a visual object, like a tree, and then you need an eye, right? Do you have an experience yet? Do you have a projection yet? No. Having just an eye and a tree, you still have no experience. What makes an experience is the, is the sight consciousness. If the eye, the organ eye was seeing the tree, then in theory, you could take someone's eye out of their head, put it down, and it would still see a tree, right? But we know that that's not what happens. I mean, whether it happens or not, there's no awareness that it happens. The awareness, we need awareness. So that's, so we have the mind, we need, a, we need the mind in relationship to an eye and an object. So we have a sight consciousness, sound consciousness, smell consciousness, olfactory consciousness, tactile consciousness, and mental consciousness. The mental consciousness being, you know, the one that's aware, like when you, of your memory, something is perceiving your memory. That's the mental consciousness. Or when you're dreaming at night and you're, you know, you're running down the road. And you say, I'm running down the road, I'm running down the road, and you see the road. That's the mental consciousness that says I'm it's experiencing the running down the road. Okay. So what happens, this is happening all this time, this interplay and inter interaction between the, the object, the organ, and the consciousness. And that's that's what we're doing every instant of our existence. Even when we're dead, it's just more subtle than. And when we're dead, when we die and go into the intermediate state, we don't have the eye, organ, nose, these five gross organs, but we still have the mind. So when you, we go into the bardo, the intermediate state, and we're having visions and seeing stuff and flying around and all this stuff, that's because we're just a mental consciousness at that point. The other Six another five consciousnesses are dormant. Okay. And that might last a minute or up to 49 days. But with each perception, in instantly, 
clinging arises. Okay? That's why we see things as permanent when they're not. Without break, each perception, which is, we, first of all, we see things not correctly anyway. We, in that very instant, the very next instant of the perception is a clinging, a sticking. That's why we have to freeze things because we can't stick to something that's moving, can we? If there's no attachment or, 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 or grasping, uh, when you see things moving like smoke, very hard to, st- you can't stick a post-it note on smoke, can you? The mind itself, it, mind and reality is more like smoke than like concrete, but we see things as concrete. Okay. You with me? It's kind of exciting, actually. Well, for me, I maybe mean, I'm just a Dharma nerd. I don't know. Okay. So it's now one o'clock. I'm supposed to stop. But uh, would people like to have any comments or questions, arguments, criticisms? You're also quiet today. Uh, should I take that as a good sign that you're quiet? Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, Anna? Karuna, um, just talking about the um, psychological side, when now I've, I've started to look deeper into the mind and its work, and, um, and I'm not too good with my, my use of language at the moment, but it's, I did go through some experiences where I just literally felt like I was cracking up literally lost the plot. How am I thinking this way and that way? Then I'm looking at certain situations where um, I've got something going on. It's been going on for four years and I've, I've, I've put so much energy and effort into trying to rectify this and getting things right. And I'm mm-hmm. blaming this person and that person. But then I look a little bit <clears throat> on the nature of reality and my you know, involvement in it complete involvement my karma and the reaction to myself is oh my gosh but then I think of these other people and it's like a rage exactly the same things happens so I'm seeing how biased Mm -hmm. you know how biased I am um and I feel I feel like it's like chunks of ice this is literally the visualization I got chunks and slides of ice were just coming away from me coming away coming you know it's it it's it is really empowering because within that you see your responsibility and you know your um your 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 involvement you are yeah. in charge of it all yeah. yeah um and i i'm i'm i've been fearful well one of my fears is i think i think i'm gonna lose myself but i don't Right. Again, a lot more. Right. Um, and but the more not- I open up, the more things just come into my path. And I don't have the answer or even maybe a form of a question for some of these things going on in my head. But the next minute, it's there. Or somebody's talking about it, or there's a video on, or I've read something and things. So a lot now for me, a lot of the time, it's a there's a lot of um, faith. Backed up with previous evidence, but I'm, I'm working on a lot of faith. That's um, uh, it's quite amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. So I, I want to just underscore that that a couple of things you you well, it's one thing the, the 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 amazing things that happen once we shift. Um, I remember people used to have well, they do anyway, but like with Lama Yeshi. People would have these these remarkable experiences around him, right? And they would they and he was just, so he would say publicly, he says, you know, people think that I'm magical. He says, I'm not magical. Your mind is magical. And I totally agree that the more we have confidence, it takes courage. Yeah. It takes courage at least in the beginning, and then you become more convinced. Something's something really weird. It's it's not to be too cliche about it, but you know, this idea of a parallel universe, you know, 
there's a whole other universe going on. And that's what Buddhists thought. It's the universe of reality. So it's not, yeah, it's the universe of reality. And, and as one, uh, as we opened up and be, to that possibility and open up to it, there's this whole other thing that's going on around us that we never knew about, you know? And it's not, they say it's hidden. It is hidden, but it's hidden in plain sight. You know what I mean? It's hidden in plain sight. So this whole process we're starting is the beginning of the chipping away at the belief that what everything we see and hear and smell and taste and feel and think is real. It, it is the thing. Okay. It's not that those things are, are, are non-existent, perhaps. It's just that their level of existence is really not that, it's not profound at all. And we think it's the most profound, like going to the Giants game tomorrow night, you know, against the Dodgers, you know, that's the most profound thing we could do because we're going to go to the playoff, you know, I'm just making that up, right? You can choose whatever it is for you. But behind all that, you know, when we begin to shed the belief that that's so important or, you know, going for a walk on the beach tonight because it looks like it's going to be a clear night and a clear sunset, that's where we go. And the more we give that up, something does fill it. It's remarkable. And that remarkable part is this this whole other universe. And and it's in in relationship to the universe we're in, by the way. That's the good news. We know it's like we're we're going to Venus or something. It's like you don't go to a pure land. The pure land gets transformed right here. Okay? I think that's my belief anyway. Anything else? Yes, Shivani. So uh, one of the things was you mentioned that sometimes we are trying something uh, more, we are trying to detach, and then we experience that even with a lot more intensity. So that's the kind of uh, experience my mind is having or senses are having right now the more I am uh, trying to rationalize and I disidentify with uh, certain emotions, uh, the more it is hitting me with uh, like a sort of with a vengeance. So you, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So one was uh, that. And the second thing, if you could clarify a little more on that breathing practice, you said. Uh, okay. Uh, two things. Yeah, what was the, so what the first one, what's the question again? That, that, uh, that intensity, the, when we are trying to detach ourselves from this whole, uh, and be more into reality and okay, this is not reality, right. uh, but it tends to that experience is intensified and hitting as if trying to prove itself as a reality. Right, right. So, yeah, uh, I think I understand the, um, to, to engage in that uh, process that we're talking about, it's very, really, really important to have some, um, uh, some further intellectual understanding because um, uh, when, we start, when we start investigating reality, there's some certain, certain cautions that we need to be aware of. For example, one of the things that when people, when, when the practitioner starts investigating reality, one of the dangers is that the person goes to this other extreme and says, oh, well, therefore nothing's real, right? And I know that's not exactly what you're saying, but the, the point is that this process of investigating reality should be kind of very organized, you know, and very uh, sort of a step-by-step process. And yes, when you start looking at uh, that this is not real, then there is kind of a... a, a, a um, an intensity of what that falling away, even if it's just for a little bit, is quite an intense experience, isn't it? The, the trick is not to get hung up on it because that's just a small, it's, it's important, but you know, the process gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So yes, if it, the intensity arises, you just go with it, you know, and just go, it's going to leave by the way, <laughs> probably, you know what I mean? It'll be intense, and then all of a sudden you're back into 
you know, being on the freeway and driving and getting upset with people who are going too slow or whatever, you know, because the, the, the habit of, of unreality is long, long, long and well entrenched. But so it's like having the intensity, the insight, having some feeling of reality, you, you, you feel really blessed with that and you accept it, but you don't cling to it either. No clinging, no attachment to anything. You can't get attached to reality either. Do you know what I mean? So it's always a positive, just being easy going, easy going, relax. About the breathing. Um, so with that, you, you, when you're uh, in your, med, you know, whatever meditation, you, you know, just as long as your back is straight, you just gently inhale. And you feel the breath going down and it goes to the, around the navel. And then you hold your breath for a moment and you bring the breath up from your, like from your anus up and the two breath, two winds meet at the navel. And before you, you sense a sense of like a little radiant light, maybe like a little seed or something. And then gently, not intensely, gently those two, those two winds meet at that and they give a little fan to that light. And that light radiates a little more and it sort of pierces the darkness of your mind. This is for the foggy mind. Okay. And you just do it, you know, maybe five or six times. And then you, then you, you know, it's the main point of that, there's many, many dozens of breathing practices. So I, you know, this one is just to uh, help with the foggy mind, dull mind. Uh, you can also do it with the wandering mind. But in that case, you do the same breath, but there's different descriptions. But in this case, you just visualize, if you want, mind's very wandering, you just bring it down and maybe the light is a, a, a gentle blue light, something that's soothing and focusing. And then you exhale normally. Then you can breathe in again and do it. Try it. See if it works for you guys, uh, whether wandering mind or or uh, dull mind. Let's see if it works. Okay. Anna, write that down so I can remember to ask people. And then bring your question, whatever questions you have. There's, what's that saying? There's no wrong question. Okay. Now, so just our time together, we'll just, we'll just dedicate this energy. Uh, so otherwise, this goes poof into our unconscious so instead of just just being uh deposit our unconscious or just ripens sometime in the future who knows when we actually give a little bit of a dedication to it and we dedicate it to that this energy uh, sorry this time together these thoughts these conversations these ideas are all generated for the purpose of attaining the highest state of awakening and developing our own potential so that we may be of greatest benefit to other beings. And that in particular, the awakening mind of, of compassion and love, bodhicitta, becomes instantly awakened. And if it's already awakened within our mind streams, it increases a uh, thousandfold. So that all this energy is used to make a better world for ourselves and others. Okay, thank you. Sorry I went over so long, but I think we had fun. <laughs> Thank you, Karuna.